Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the Koch Institute. It's a pleasure to have you all here. We have a standing room only crowd, which is great to see. Uh, always nice to see a full audience of uh, happy, smiling people. Um, we're here for a very special event, actually, a, a discussion between Susan Hockfield and Robin Young on the subject of uh, Susan Hockfield's new book, which is called The Age of Living Machines, How Biology Will Build the Next Technology Revolution. Uh, it's a subject that Susan's thought a lot about over the last several years, um, really, I think, since she began her career here at MIT, and thinking about the convergence of life science and engineering and how they can be brought together to solve big problems facing humanity and society. One of those problems is cancer, and frankly speaking, if not for Susan, we wouldn't be sitting in this building right now. Uh, it was really Susan's guidance and um, assistance and frankly inspiration that got us to bring together cancer scientists and cancer-oriented engineers under one roof uh, in this building in the Koch Institute, which many of you have visited before. Some of you, I think, are new faces. It's wonderful to have you all here. We try here to sort of live by the philosophy that uh, breaking down the barriers between disciplines, in our case, cancer science and cancer-oriented engineering, um, can provide new insights, new perspectives, new solutions to the long-standing problems of cancer, which we're working on hard every day, and we thank Susan every day for that. Um, let me introduce the uh, principles of tonight's event properly. Fighting out of the blue corner, Susan Hockfield. <laughs> uh, Susan was uh, MIT's 16th president, uh, the first woman and first biologist to lead the institute. Uh, prior to that, she was at Yale University, where she didn't start her professional career. She actually started at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories and then moved to Yale in the Department of Neurobiology, uh, and then rose up the academic ranks, uh, first to dean of the graduate school and then to the provost's office. Uh, and then she joined MIT. And as I said, I think very early on in her tenure here, she realized the power of bringing fields together, disciplines together, um, which she did in many different incarnations, the Koch being an example, but not the only one. She was also responsible for initiating the MIT Energy Initiative, which has been hugely successful and more or less follows the same themes. Um, Susan became past president a few years back, and I'm pleased to say has taken her post-president's office here in the Koch Institute, so I get to see her every day. Uh, she's on my floor, actually, so that's been a personal pleasure and privilege for me. Um, Susan's been recognized by many aw and awards and honors over the years, um, most recently from Research America, where she received the Jeffrey Bean Award for her many contributions to science, and, and there's a whole long list of those. This is not Susan's first book. It's her <laughs> first mainstream book. Um, she did publish another book. <laughs> I have to refer to my notes because I frankly can't remember its name. Uh, it was called Molecular Probes of the Nervous System. Select I have that. <laughs> <laughs> Selected Methods for Antibody and Nucleic Acid Probes. So for anybody who H -turner. another version. <laughs> uh, so to introduce Robin Young, uh, she is, uh, I think, a very recognizable voice, uh, probably for everybody in the room. Robin hosts here and now on WBUR and has done for the last 10 years, actually. Um, and has been a sort of fixture in Boston radio and television um, for many, many years. What you might not know is that Robin is also uh, a Peabody Award-winning documentary filmmaker. Uh, she's also an Emmy Award winner in, for her work in television. And I learned in researching Robin that earlier in her career, she worked behind the scenes uh, in both Red Sox and Bruins broadcasts. So, that really raised her up in my estimation. <laughs> I always thought highly of you, Robin, but now, now. You're really on a pedestal. So, without further ado, please, Robin, Susan, take it away. Thank you very much. I don't know, you know, directing Bruins and Red Sox, first woman, first life scientist to lead MIT, I don't know. I think there's a little <laughs> bit more on that side of the equation. I am so honored to be here with you, Susan. Um, and I'm sure many of you here come with a deep understanding of all the work that's described in her book. Uh, some of you might be like me. I have been running around since I started reading it, you know, grabbing the lapels 
of anyone I can saying, people, do you know they are using viruses to build batteries? You know, this has been just you know, amazing to, to read about all of this. And it has sort of, to some of us, to civilians, you know, it has sort of a, a sci-fi feel to it. You were introduced today on WBUR's uh, Radio Boston, the host, I thought it was wonderful. It was just how I was feeling. He did it as kind of a, a movie trailer in a world in which viruses can build batteries. But that's the world that you describe in this book. And before we get into some of the detail uh, that's in there, talk a little bit about where you think we are. A century ago, as you uh, remind us, physics combined with engineering. We had radio, telephones, radar, computers, physical parts. Uh, convergence 1.0 today, you talk about Convergence 2.0. So give us the broad overview there. Yeah, well, thank you, Robin. We're thrilled to have you conducting this interview. I'm really personally quite pleased. It's uh, better than meeting on the street, which we tend to do. <laughs> we've done that. Yes. Which is a small town, right? happily. Um, so one of my responsibilities as president was to look out into the future and figure out how MIT was going to get there and hopefully get there before everyone else. And when I thought about the future we're living in today, I realized that this fantastic digital technology, gosh, does anyone have a cell phone with them? <laughs> that we all carry around in our pocketbooks or pockets is a product of the convergence of physics with engineering. So physicists around 1900 began to decode the parts of the physical world, the electron, the neutron, the proton, and engineers love parts lists, and they picked up those parts and turned them into these fantastic technologies. The electronics industry, I don't think was an industry in 1900, but it sure was a booming industry in the 20th century, and that gave rise to the computer and information industries. Transformed our lives more profoundly, I think, than any other technology. And um, as I thought about what the analogous process would be for the next future, I realized that biology had previously been a descriptive science, but starting in the 1950s, it also became a science for which we understood its parts. Yeah. So the molecular biology revolution showed us about DNA and RNA and proteins, and genomics powered that up by allowing us to understand living things, not one gene at a time, but many genes together. And that provided the parts list that engineers have picked up and turned into new technologies. When I arrived at MIT, I had to learn about the Institute pretty darn fast, and I listened to everyone I could possibly get to talk to me. The then Dean of Engineering, Tom Magnanti, reminded me that MIT School of Engineering had almost 400 faculty, the largest school, and you better pay attention to that, the Dean was telling me. But then he told me something absolutely astonishing. He said a third of the faculty in the School of Engineering were using biology in their work. And I thought, oh yeah, yeah biomedicine, right? And he said, oh, no, no, no. Bio, biomedicine and way beyond. And that was the moment when this door opened into the world of engineering and biology in partnership to develop technologies that really do sound like science fiction, but they're happening, they're real, and if we can do it right, it's going to speed us to new products for the marketplace. Let's take a look. And we're at the Koch Institute. And by the way, congratulations to everyone here for the great work being done here. So let's talk about uh, cancer advances. And you go through the genetic breakthroughs, the discovery of the chicken infecting virus that could turn a normal cell into a cancer cell, and you know, take us through to how we have ways of detecting cancer cells. But usually, it's way too late after they've reached a mass or when they've left traces in the blood. Uh, so how to get to them earlier, and that brings us to Sangeeta Bhatia. You recruited her to MIT. She's now here at the Koch Institute, was here this evening, um, with cancer-fighting nanoparticles. So set this up, because I know you want to do a reading. So Sangeeta, along with other people here in the Koch Institute, is very interested in how we detect cancer earlier. You know, um, for many diseases, the earlier we can detect it, the greater the probability of finding a cure. And uh, Sangeeta is a brilliant biomedical engineer physician. And she has come up with a spectacular possibility of detecting cancer early, early enough, so that if you could get it out, you would get a cure. Can I read a little bit about uh, it? Please do. I'm not going to say no to see <laughs> wants to read. All right. So this is a chapter that is about these uh, cancer-fighting nanoparticles. 
The discovery came as they were evaluating the results of their experiments. In doing so, they noticed a puzzling detail. In addition to seeing the hoped for specific MRI signal at tumor sites in their laboratory mice, they also detected an unexpected fluorescent signal in the bladder. Now, it would have been easy to dismiss a signal in the bladder as an experimental artifact, not worth noting. The bladder accumulates urine, and after all, urine is a waste stream that might naturally contain elements of the protein shields and tethers that the kidney had filtered out as it routinely processed the blood. But there could be other explanations, and the unexpected findings stumped Batya's students, who feared that the aberrant signal in the bladder indicated that the experiment had failed. But when they brought their results to Batya, she recognized that something unusual and interesting was happening. My medical training told me that there was no way that our fully assembled nanoparticles could make it into the urine, she said. They're just way too big to pass through the kidney's filter. Batya felt compelled to understand what was going on, and with some sophisticated biological detective work, she figured it out. The fluorescent tags generating the signal in the bladder were not attached to intact nanoparticles. Instead, they had made it through the kidney on small pieces of the protein tethers that had attached the shields to the nanoparticles. As soon as Batya understood what was happening, she recognized that she and her team had discovered a biological mechanism that they could potentially deploy as a simple and reliable means for very early cancer diagnosis. If so, it would be a revolutionary clinical advance. <laughs> to accelerate the clinical development of this remarkable new technology, Batya has launched a company called Glimpse Bio, which anticipates the development of a market-ready market urine test by 2020. She and her colleagues at the company plan to develop a set of new diagnostic technologies that will enable the early detection of not just cancer, but many other types of disease as well. Bacha speaking. We spend so much time and money trying to keep our patients from dying during the last stages of a disease. But for many diseases, if we can detect it early, we can treat it before it has become untreatable. The accelerating convergence of nanoengineering and biology in the coming decades will bring new technologies that we can't even imagine today nanotechnologies that will profoundly transform how we deliver healthcare and battle disease. Batya has no doubts at all about this. The future, she says, is small. <laughs> so take us back now, how small? Because you say 10 nanometer particles, uh, it would take 100,000 of them to fill the period at the end of a sentence. Yeah. So what is the nanoparticle? And you talked about the protein. How were they hooked together to go find you know, this, either the cancer cell or to be found in a urine test yeah. afterwards? Yeah, so it's a fascinating technology. And she calls them synthetic biomarkers. And it's, again, this kind of crazy mashup of biology with engineering. So nanoparticles are anything that is very small, so smaller than 1 1,000th of the width of a hair. And they come in a lot of different shapes, a lot of different sizes, engineers, nanotechnologists, has spent a lot of time figuring out how to build them for specific purposes. So she builds them for biological purposes, and she decorates them with these very short little segments of protein. But her great insight was that proteins can get cut by another kind of protein called an enzyme. Enzymes are highly specific. Tissues have specific enzymes. Diseases have specific enzymes. And each of those enzymes has a target protein that it will cut. So she figured out that she would decorate nanoparticles. They're just the vehicle. I love the word decorate. Yes, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> With brilliantly colored, no, they're not brilliantly colored. <laughs> Actually, they probably are brilliantly colored, if you could see them. Um, with these very short segments of a protein that carried the enzymatic site for a cancer enzyme. So for cancer to move into a tissue, it has to carve its way. And it carves its way with a particular enzyme. And so the proteins on these nanoparticles have the site that those enzymes see. So if you don't have cancer, those particles circulate and nothing happens to them and eventually you know, they leave the body. But if you do have cancer, the enzyme clips those protein segments and releasing a little tiny fragment. And she's designed that tiny fragment to be small enough, five nanometers, to get filtered by the kidney into the urine. That's what kidneys do. They filter out things that you don't want if they're very small into the urine. Big things you don't want come out a different way. 
But we're not going to talk about that. No. That's but the true. point of putting something in the urine is that she now has developed a urine-based diagnostic test. Now, does anyone know of a cheap, really accurate, really easy urine-based diagnostic test? <laughs> Excuse me. Looking at the audience, probably not many of you have used the over-the-counter pregnancy test. It's a fantastic innovation. It's cheap. It's easy. And so in Sangeeta's mind, when you go for your annual physical, you could have a urine test and detect all kinds of things with very high accuracy, very inexpensively. And the beautiful thing about this, this uh, tech detection method is she can detect tumors, at least in mice right now, that are about the tenth the size of our current detection methodologies. So they're going to the clinic in 2020, and I don't know, you know, you never know whether these new technologies are gonna succeed or fail, but it is a really promising technology for finding disease early and being able to uh, sure. cure it. And, and what I love is that they, as with many of the people that you profile, they thought they made a mistake when they saw these shiny. <laughs> is that the nanometers that were shining in the shining in the kidney? They had tagged them with a with a fluorescent label that allowed them to see them, what, where they were traveling. And that ter it turns out that's that, that's exactly where they should be and needed to be to do what they ultimately did. With Robin, them. you've hit on a point that I just find amazing, and I'm happy to have been able to tell these stories of the people who made these technologies real. You know, these pioneers, they're curious and they're courageous. So to pursue something they weren't expecting, and that that was actually where the great advance lay. I mean, that is the story of many of these people in the book, that they didn't set out to accomplish what they've accomplished, but because their eyes, their mind were tuned to the possibility, they were able to turn something unexpected into something really important. Well, many of them are women, which is exciting. Well, yes, I, I, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so odd that that would happen. It was odd, yeah, that um, they just showed up in the book. But. Right. Um, uh, which, which brings us to biologically constructed electronics and Angie Belcher, who came up with this idea in the 1990s, I think. She was inspired, I love this, inspired by large uh, sea snails, sea abalones, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, and how they make their shells. Now, the abalone alone is a miracle, what it does. So describe that first. Yeah, so Angie uh, was a student at UC Santa Barbara, and she loved watch, walking the beach. Who doesn't? Uh, but she loved walking the beach because she loved these abalone shells that you know were, are around the beach. You walk on the beach, there are shells. Abalone shells are incredibly strong. They're very lightweight. They're quite beautiful. And um, abalone make them. Abalone is a sea snail by simply picking up components from the ocean water and putting them together to form these shells. When an abalone dies, the shell disintegrates back into its component parts that are ready Actually. for the next abalone to build its shell or some other sea creature. And the thing that captured Angie's imagination was that abalone build this technology and then the technology goes away without contaminating its environment. So Angie said, if abalone can do this construction and deconstruction without messing up their world, why can't we? And so she thought, well, can't we use nature's genius to build the things that we need? I mean, we don't have much use for abalone shells, but there are things that we could use if we could figure out how nature could build them for us. Well, you, before we get to what she did, you also remind us, uh, or at least I felt this way, that it was also pretty awesome when Alessandro Volta showed that alternating disks of copper and zinc stacked together, separated by a strip of salty brine soaked, soaked cloth, could generate a current. What? I mean, I, I made a note in the margin, <laughs> you know, like a lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> kind of relate to it. You know, but that's amazing. Um, uh, you know, moving chemical energy to electrical energy, mm -hmm. but producing tons of waste. So back to our abalone, what was the- yeah, let, me just, let me just reflect on Volta. So we think about Volta as the guy who invented batteries. But you know what? That wasn't what he was doing. He was just fiddling around with things and trying to understand how nature works. Well, that's what I thought. Uh, it who wakes up and thinks, I'm going to put disks of copper and zinc separated by a, stri by a strip of salty brine soaked cloth together? Who thinks well, that? <laughs> Scientists do, yeah. uh, because they have some inkling that something might work. And, um, 
I'll tell you a story. When I was starting my lab, one of my mentors uh, kept asking me how many people I had in the lab. And finally, I got to 10. And he said, oh, that's great. Now something will always be working. <laughs> and I just did that really quick calculation. So 10% of the experiments work. If you're really good, 10% of the experiments work because you know you see these crazy things. You pick them up. You see if it, they fit together. So mostly fail. And I'm sure that Volta must have failed yeah. nine out of 10 times. You know, probably more like you know 19 out of 20 times before he. But he wasn't building a battery. The important thing is fundamental research happens just out of curiosity and out of an interest in figuring out things work. And it's a separate step to turn those discoveries into a, part, a, a product, and it's a different kind of genius. Can you tell us briefly what Angie Belcher did, that how she got from abalones to batteries? Yeah, so she started out building just wires to see if she could get viruses, uh, basically lab strains of viruses, which are benign. If she could persuade viruses to evolve to build wires. Why viruses? Um, they're easy to manipulate. Uh, you can just purchase them you know, commercially. You can? Um, well, in the lab, you can. It, uh, we can, we can. Okay. You probably could too, but anyway, let's not go there, <laughs> for the moment at least. Um, and, uh, but, but we know a lot about the structure of viruses, we know a lot about how they encode for proteins, and so we can manipulate them fairly easily. So they're very well studied, they're a, a, a lab reagent, essentially. And they move things, they move DNA. They, they move DNA, yep, they've got DNA or RNA, they make proteins, in, and um, the nice thing about the virus she chose, she chose a, a long cylindrical virus. But the point was that, that she figured out how to get viruses not just to bind organic materials, which is what viruses normally do, like the cells they're going to infect, right? But whether they could bind to inorganic materials like metals. And so she evolved viruses through a very, you know, manipulations and found, well, sure, they can bind metals. Isn't that great? Well, what can I do with that? <laughs> so she said, metals. Hmm. That would work for batteries. And so she evolved viruses uh, using, as I say, various experimental strategies that could bind the components of batteries. So the viruses organize these battery components, the metals that build batteries. But because the battery she uses is beautiful cylinder, I'd liken it to a Twizzler. Those of you maybe have had Twizzler candies. Once or twice. Yeah, I'm sure no more than that. Um, in any case. Um, they then lie down in, in a crystalline array, so they organize themselves beautifully, use, holding onto the battery materials. So she created viruses that build cathodes and viruses that build anodes, and she puts them together and packages them. This just slayed me. She said, well, here, here's a battery, and it was this, I mean, it looked like the battery I put in my watch. I said, what's the story? It looks just like my watch battery. She said, we just use the packaging. So those metal coin cells, you can put anything inside them. She puts viruses inside them. You know, standard batteries don't have viruses that make the, uh, that have made the, uh, the battery components organized. But, so here's the thing. We desperately need to store energy. We've got a big energy problem. It's estimated that the energy demand's gonna be twice what it is today by 2050. And right now, we're really dependent on, on fossil fuels. We've got to get out of them for lots of reasons. Let's just set that aside for a minute. But if you like using solar or you like using wind, yeah, it's great when the sun's shining or the wind's blowing, but that's, that's not always the case. And we cannot store energy well enough or sustainably mm -hmm. to support those technologies. So the rate-limiting technology for all alternative energy is, is energy storage, is batteries. Now, I don't want to discourage anyone who's driving an electric car. However, those acres of battery plants yeah. in the Southwest require an enormous amount of energy to build batteries. It's a heat intensive process, so it consumes energy. That's not very efficient. And along the way, it produces lots of toxic byproducts. That's not very sustainable either. That's not an abalone kind of strategy. <laughs> so Angie's batteries, these virus made batteries, she makes uh, at room temperature and without any toxic byproducts. What happens to the viruses? Do they? Well, the viruses are not living when they, oh. when, so they accumulate the metals, uh, but they are, not, they are no longer living when they are assembled into the batteries. They've done their job. They've done their job. 
they continue to keep their structure, so they st still maintain the organization, but they can't reproduce. They can't do the things that viruses do. They can't give you a flu or anything like that. It's amazing. It I mean, amazing. You, you described them as Twizzlers. I noted another one looked like tiny rocket ships with landing gear on one. Yeah, there are viruses that look like that. <laughs> I'm reading about these two women, um, both Angie and um, Batia. Sangeeta, yeah. Sangeeta Batia. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, the, first of all, the joy that you describe they have. And it starts to make me a little angry because I know we are in 2019 and I look out and I see so many women here and I see you um, and I read about them. But when I was coming up, which is about when you were coming up, um, young women weren't encouraged to have that kind of excitement and thrill and joy and talk about things like decorating. You know, these are women's words. I mean, I was reading and the way I can remember is it's a lasagna. I mean, you know, there's sort of a, a almost a, I don't want to say feminine approach. That's not what I mean. But uh, just uh, pause for a second and talk about what it means for you to see these young women with this joy and exuberance and seeing the, the art really, I mean, in what they are doing, it, there's, it's, an, it's an art. Um, there's a lot of art in the science, and I love hearing about scientific or engineering advances. I, I don't care who produces them. However, I get a lot of personal joy to see our women scientists and engineers doing such extraordinary things. Now, when I became the first woman president of MIT, um, among the things that um, I noted, it wasn't you that. You that into conversation, you know. I just. I was the first woman. <laughs> I mean, it's an extraordinary sentence, so. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. I would use it every day. <laughs> pretty amazing to have been president of MIT, no matter, you know, what your gender. But, but I, I, did, I did make the observation when I started that the uh, metaphors were going to change. Uh, I was shifting to, uh, you know, I always use gardening and cooking metaphors. I'm not much on athletic metaphors. You know? <laughs> I'm not sure how the scores are kept in most games. So, um, but, but this, of course, is reflected in how I write. Um, you know, when I think about what something looks like or what it feels like, um, I'm more likely to refer to um, you know, something in nature uh, rather than uh, well, the, how a listen, flower grows. Then. This is happening uh, at NPR, just to take a second. Um, there are a group of us who decided we don't want to use gun metaphors anymore. Yeah. So, we trying even saying things like "take your best shot" or "in the line of fire" or "targeted." Um, we're trying not to use them. Oh, great! Good yeah. for you. Good yeah. for you. Good I for mean, you. It's just a small, yeah. just a small thing. Um, and and um, I just wondered. I want to go on to hear about some of these other discoveries. And by the way, we're going to have questions from you as well. Um, when you were coming up, we both we were both in New York. Um, yeah. Did you feel roadblocks, or did you feel, did you not, did you get a sense you could do anything? So I had three sisters, and for whatever reason, my parents, who are, were both the children of immigrants, uh, never suggested that there was anything we couldn't do. They were very interested in our discovering where our passion was and um, allowing us to pursue it. From where? Where were they from? Um, from Eastern Europe and Russia. My, my grandparents, uh, and um, both of my parents were born in the United States, first generation, uh, with first generation kind of values. Work hard, study hard, uh, and you can be you know, what you want to be. So you didn't feel the impediments? I didn't, and I think some of that is just, um, let's just say, uh, true confessions. Um, I kind of wear blinders when I walk around. <laughs> when there's a job to be done, I just put my head down and get it done. And I don't imagine uh, that the impediments I confront are any different from anyone else's. They're just, you know, yeah. the way the cards are dealt and you, you deal with them. And so I think um, I must have been, actually, I know it was hard <clears throat> for my parents that I was pretty stubborn. However, it worked. Yeah, well, and I can understand that too as somebody who all, you know, mm. came through up in the 70s. Um, it's only in retrospect now that I see, oh, well, yeah, maybe that wasn't. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> we won't talk about that. Right. Uh, well, in another time. Um, so I want to go on to some of these discoveries, get a couple more in, because they really are amazing. Peter Agree, is that how you? Peter Agree. Agree. Mm -hmm. Discovered, uh, at John, he was at Johns Hopkins. He was trying to get a protein that caused the terrible RH disease, which can attack a fetus. Yeah. Um, instead, he discovered the water channel that enables water to cross cell membranes. Now, that's obviously just the, just the broad brush. And mm -hmm. went on from there 
to make a water filter. Can, can you give us a brief? Yeah, this was another just crazy, crazy story. Um, any of you who wants to get a sense of Peter Agre's personality, uh, go on YouTube and uh, search for singing the periodic table. <laughs> There's a great YouTube of him singing, a, a, a great guy, a hematologist. And uh, he decided that his project, his scientific research, would be on this Rh protein. Now, happily, we have ways of mitigating the effect of the mother producing antibodies against her baby's um, Rh protein that may not ma match her own. We didn't know what the Rh protein was, so he said, I'm going to figure this out. Went through this elaborate, complicated purification process, ended up with a band on a gel, which is what you want. He made antibodies to it, and it was not the Rh protein. And um, you know, normally what you do is go back and do it again and again and again until you got the protein you wanted. But he was just a, just curious, and he tried to figure out what this protein was. Couldn't figure it out. Now, Robin is just in the water channel, as though of course. Well, people had sought the water channel for decades. People are looking for it and looking for it. It's the a holy grail. Yeah, how do you get water in and out of a cell? cell? There's got to be a water channel. And no one could find it. So then all of the smart people who studied water and cells said, there's not a water channel. Water crosses the cell membrane by diffusion. End of story. So Peter was faced with going back to try and get the Rh protein or working on a protein that could be the water channel, which didn't exist. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was just a, a really crazy thing that he decided to go, go for this protein. It ended up to be the water channel. Very important. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for it, a terrifically important discovery, and went on to characterize it in great detail. It is a beautiful protein. One of the themes of the book is nature's genius. It's like abalone, building these shells. Nature's genius. Could we not use nature's genius to solve our problems? So um, a biophysicist, entrepreneur, read one of Peter's papers, saw this gorgeous water channel. And I don't know how he made this leap, but he said, huh, I wonder if we could use that to filter water. Started a company. The company's located outside Copenhagen. And they are building water filters using this water channel. Instead of what? Instead of uh, water filters n n normally now, so if you want to purify things, they are very carefully chemically engineered. And um, you know they're slow. Uh, they're inefficient. Uh, it's what we've been doing. We've been purifying water for thousands of years. There's never been enough potable water for human life. And so we have always had to filter water. And um, you know, how you make these filters, the chemical uh, engineered filters, is not a very happy process. And, uh, so now we have, or this company, Aquaporin AS, is building water filters. They have built filters for the home first, and they're in homes in Asia. But it's just a crazy idea. Peter Holm Jensen, who's the founder of this company, when I visited the company, it's where I got this term, nature's genius. He said, you know, we could bust our brains trying to figure out how to build a water filtering molecule. Why would we do that? We'll just use nature's genius. Is it? And, and, just, and so just to, to complete the thought, in the same way that this water channel allows water to come from one side of the cell to the other, it would keep, let's say, salty water on one side of these filters and somehow channel it through exactly. to be... So you have a, a filter, and in the filter, rather than a honeycomb of, of uh, chemical structures, set these water channels. And the salt yeah. water... Out of protein? proteins. Proteins. Yeah. Proteins. Yeah. Actually, they get E. coli. They get a bacteria to make boatloads of this. <laughs> Why would we make it? And these uh, water channel proteins, which are like little barrels without a top or a bottom, sit in this membrane, and uh, the contaminated water on one side gets filtered through. But the water channel doesn't let anything pass except for water. So on the other side, it's pure water. It's it, it, yeah. Um, it's amazing. It, it is amazing. And you know, it's just, they do it a lot more efficiently than these filters that we've built by busting our brains. <laughs> you mentioned E. coli, and we talked about viruses and how I can go buy some. Mm. And you know, for, this, for the civilian, the, one of the reactions to, I mean, I, I'm thinking beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Mm. But there's also, I know, a voice that would say, well, 
are there ethical questions here? Mm -hmm. You know, about using E. coli to make water filters or have viruses flying around, you know, mm -hmm. doing things. I mean, are there? So um, when you work in a laboratory of any kind, it's very important to know where the guardrails are. Very important to know where the dangers lie. Some we can predict, some we can't. And um, you know, when we work in laboratories, there are all kinds of regulations about how we dispose of things and basically how we use them, how we robe ourselves when we use them, just to prevent any kind of a contamination. So I think that um, I, I don't feel badly about making the E. coli make a lot of protein for us, actually. Uh, that's how our new biopharmaceutical drugs are made. And Aquaporin just imported the technologies from the biopharmaceutical industry <laughs> to make fil water filters. Um, so I don't worry about that, but something I always remind people is that technology is agnostic. People can use technology for good or for ill, and it's up to us, it's up to us as members of a society to set constraints that make it less likely that the technologies that we have in our hands will be used for improper purposes. It's a hard thing to do, um, but we all have to agree uh, to basically obey the rules. And you know, it's not just true for new technologies. It's true for old technologies too, like guns. Yeah. That brings us to, just briefly, I want to touch on um, food modification and uh -huh. you know, trying to feed this world. You keep saying 2050. Yeah. And I just did um, David Wallace Wells' unbelievable new book, The Uninhabitable Earth. We have until 2050, you know, 30 years is about it. Um, right. And so uh, figuring out ways to produce more food without using more land and, you know, all of that for uh, the world's people, so important. But I was stopped at uh, the chapter, and it just happened to be this week when I was also reporting on another aspect of this, you talked about Roundup and how if you had herbicide, uh, uh, herbicide-resistant corn, you can treat the ground around it with Roundup to control the weeds without damaging the corn. And just that day, I'd reported on the jury award of something like $280 million to a couple who worked with Roundup and had cancer. And the jury had, this is like the third huge award for somebody who, you know, a groundskeeper, you know, people who worked with Roundup. And that, you know, brought me up short because you did go on to say there are boards that feel that it's safe if handled properly, but it also has some kind of cancer-causing aspect to it. Um, so all of the scientific evidence indicate that it doesn't have any cancer causing. How does that happen? Um, but there is a report from an international organization that um, says it could, but so could a number of things that we consider, consider entirely innocuous. I don't um, have a good sense of where these, uh, you know, this groundswell of enthusiasm around something that has been scientifically proven to be false uh, comes from. The National Academies of Science uh, did a report, a very big report that came out a couple of years ago, looking at all of these uh, ways in which we've improved crop yield. And they've demonstrated, in fact, not that they don't have deleterious consequences, but actually have beneficial consequences. So it's not just that crops that are using Roundup-ready plants and Roundup to kill weeds uh, have an effect on that field. They have an effect broadly to reduce pesticide use in, in crops around them. So there are many benefits. Now, I say that understanding that science is never finished, and it may be at some point we'll find out that Roundup has done something wrong. But I, I'll tell you, so as I read more and more about agriculture and the difficulty of feeding uh, you know, 9.7 billion people, we need to produce twice as much food as we have today. And you know, we can think about in the United States where we've been producing corn at astronomically increasing rates of productivity. Actually, it's quite amazing. Um, in 1930, um, we were producing corn at 30 bushels an acre, and today it's 150 bushels an acre. So we need to do that again in order to meet the food needs by 2050. But the place that just breaks my heart is in developing countries where they are subsistence farming. And um, the story that uh, I found just, you know, it actually makes me weep to think about it. Cassava is a subsistence crop in a lot of incredibly poor countries. Well, there's a virus right now that will destroy, we know because in many places, cassava has already been wiped out by this virus. These people don't have any alternative food than cassava. 
And a group has been working on a genetically modified cassava plant that resists the virus. And you know, those forces that don't believe in science are, have tried to prohibit the development of this cassava plant. And to me, this is just, you know, I, I mean, sorry to use a term like this, it's genocide. You know, we will, people will die if we don't figure out how to produce these plants. You now, say genetically modified food, and there's some yeah. people who think, you know, Franken food, and it's going yeah. to get out of control, and it's going to get in a microp, and before you know it, and if you're not right, you, you know. Yeah, no, so this is, this, is, this is a war that is about as vexed as the war about, about climate change and whether we need to do something about it. So I think what's important for us is to understand that science is never finished, and we will need to use the best science available to make decisions today with the understanding that we'll continue to watch. And if something you know, bad happens, you know, we'll stop doing it. But we can't prevent progress by, by discarding the good science and somehow using someone's weird idea. I mean, for, I, mean I can't tell you how many times epics I've um, read something about cell phones causing brain cancer. Not yet. Not yet, you know. <laughs> so. Wait, do they? No, they don't. Oh. No, they don't. No, no, they don't. But it's another one of these urban myths, beyond urban myths. And, and I think one of the difficulties, and I think one of the things, one of the responsibilities of scientists is to help tell the story in ways that people can understand. Therefore, the book. Because if people can't understand what we're saying, they suspect that we're lying or, you know, somehow changing the story. So it's very important that we communicate more clearly to a larger population about the great possibilities. Well, I find it interesting, too, and we're going to uh, wrap up soon so that we can take questions from the audience, but this is suspicion that comes from both ends of the political spectrum. Absolutely. Because on the left, you have those who are worried about tampering with nature. On the right, you have the climate change deniers. You're squeezed. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, um, it is uh, it, it, it is a problem, but the opportunities are absolutely fantastic. And in terms of crops, you know, you, you have to understand that people have been genetically modifying food for thousands of years. We would not have corn with more than seven kernels on it if corn plants had not been genetically modified. Now, the people who crossbred corn and figured out how to build, bring these hybrids, you know, uh, you know further along, didn't know. Genes didn't, weren't called genes then, so they didn't know they were uh, gene engineers, but they were. So we have been modifying the world around us in any number of ways, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not so good. So it's step by step. Susan Hockfield, I, I, we could talk forever, and I hope we get another opportunity, maybe with a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> but now I do think uh, we want to open it up to questions, so thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you.